AMD is a company revitalized by recent success. Ryzen CPU line, disruptive in terms of price, core counts and platform features and with Ryzen 5000, the increase in gaming performance was the final piece of the puzzle. For now at least, AMD's dominance in the CPU market is undeniable. But what about graphics? Well, with the release of the RDNA 2 architecture, we now see AMD competing in the high-end space and now they're taking it down more into the mainstream sector with the arrival of the new RX 6700 XT. It's a fascinating alternative to Nvidia's RTX 3060 Ti and 3070 in the $400 to $500 price bracket. I do feel perhaps it's a step or two behind in the process to comprehensively battle Nvidia on all fronts, but the 6700 XT is clearly another step onwards in capturing more of a graphics market that's just dominated by Team Green. And this is it, the reference card here, supplied for review by AMD itself. And in terms of construction, fit and finish, these are key components in hammering home that Radeon is now a much more serious contender. The chassis is solid and built from quality materials and hopefully the AMD blowers are now a thing of the past. Custom designed dual axial fans here, a graphite based thermal interface material and a zero RPM fan mode under light load. There's a sense here that features usually found on quality third party boards are now contained within the reference design. It's a clear step up and it's also whisper quiet too for the most part, just like it's big Navi equivalents. The card itself seems to be much the same length as its bigger brothers but perhaps not quite so high and it has around the same depth as the RX 6800. So not quite as chunky as the 6800 XT or 6900 XT. Still pretty meaty in the hand though however, certainly up against the founders designs for the RTX 3060 Ti and RTX 3070. AMD's total board power metric puts this at 230 watts and it requires an 8-pin and a 6-pin power input up against the single 8-pin input required for the NVIDIA competition, albeit via the power adapter converter dongle thingy. Display outputs, much the same as the 6800 actually, with three display ports and HDMI 2.1, though the USB-C display output has gone. Taking a look at specs to get an idea of how this fits into the RDNA 2 stack, here's how everything shakes out. With 40 RDNA 2 compute units, you get two thirds the compute hardware of the 6800, but you'll note that boost clock there is considerably higher. 2581 MHz boost is the max in the specification, but the game clock is much more indicative of in-game frequencies, which I saw in the 2.4 to 2.5 GHz range. Sheer frequency is hugely important, and RDNA 2 has seen a gigantic leap over its predecessor here. I mean the RX 5700 XT mostly topped out at around 1750 MHz at reference clocks, so this is part and parcel of a card that easily outpaces RDNA 1. I think I mentioned in a DF Direct Weekly a couple of weeks back that back in the day it was Nvidia pushing clocks high and using a more efficient memory interface than the competition. These days Ampere sits at around the 1.9 GHz limit. So AMD deserves kudos for taking point here. Clock speeds are of crucial importance. Oh yes, and the memory side of things, 12 gigs of GDDR6 in the reference design here, augmented somewhat by the 96 megs of Ondai Infinity Cache. Again, a new innovation in the desktop RDNA 2 cards, and while less effective at extreme resolutions like 4K, it's a good fit for the 1440p target resolution 6700 XT aims for. So what are the natural comparison points then for this product? Well, as usual in our Eurogamer text review, you'll see all the relevant competitor cards and we have the full 1080p, 1440p and 4K breakdown. In this video review, the focus is the 1440p resolution that AMD has chosen as the key battleground and we'll be comparing the card against the two closest Ampere offerings from Nvidia, RTX 3060 Ti and RTX 3070 along with the next step up from AMD itself, uh, the Radeon RX 6800, the card that arguably offers perhaps the best balance of price versus performance, certainly in the trio of big Navi offerings. We'll be looking at rasterized performance, addressing ray tracing and also revisiting resizable bar. 
a feature that seemingly offers a free performance boost out of nowhere and one that works best at 1080p and 1440p. A good match, therefore, for the 6700 XT's target market. First up, a quick word on AMD's claims for the card in the run-up to launch. In press briefings after the initial reveal, editors took Team Red to task on two points made in their marketing. Firstly, that the RX 6700 XT was the king of 1440p max setting gaming. Turns out that max settings does not include ray tracing being enabled, which by definition therefore is not max settings. RX 6700 XT is an excellent rasterizer, as you shall see, but there's no silver bullet for its RT performance, which scales in line with RX 6800. Secondly, the 12 gigs of RAM was highlighted with numbers showing games demanding more than 8 gigs, an attempt to show that competing cards from Nvidia wouldn't have enough memory for the tasks at hand. I think AMD's stats here bear further scrutiny, but certainly in our tests, 8 gigabytes of VRAM was enough for 1440p gaming, but there was one exception we'll get to later. More memory is always a nice thing to have though, to be sure, and there is a degree of future-proofing by having that extra allocation. The question is the extent to which that memory will be used in the lifespan of the card, assuming a two to three year upgrade cadence. I guess the big question for me is pricing. Okay, perhaps it's kind of irrelevant right now in a world where the basic concept, being able to buy a new GPU, is almost academic. But the $480 price point that AMD has chosen here puts it right up against RTX 3070, which has features like DLSS along with a lot more capable ray tracing capabilities. Then there's the idea of the $400 3060 Ti. 6700 XT has to be a fair bit faster than that across the board to make a mark. And this is quite problematic to assess really, because some games favor AMD architectures, some favor Nvidia. Let's visualize the price versus performance dilemma here. Remedy's control runs better on GeForce, no doubt about it. So even before you factor in the accelerant of DLSS and what is an utterly superb ray tracing implementation, uh, it's not enabled here in this benchmark though, the bottom line is that the 6700 XT is beaten by a card that's $80 cheaper. But here in Borderlands 3, not only does the 6700 XT roundly see off 3060 Ti, it's faster than the 3070 too say this a lot in my GPU reviews, but all reviewers only have a short time to review any given product. The choice of titles will have a great bearing on how value is perceived, and I happen to think that the strength and depth in reviewing from the tech press has never been better, so lean into that and make that plurality of quality data work for you when it comes to choosing component upgrades. But let's crack on and take a look at some key titles in our lineup. And we'll start with Assassin's Creed Odyssey, a title that has been somewhat held back on AMD hardware over the ages. Team Red's DX11 driver is often proclaimed as the reason for this game's issues, and perhaps it is at lower resolutions. But historically, this game hasn't been great for scalability across the board, really, AMD or Nvidia cards. But here, the 6700 XT has an 18-point lead over 3060 Ti and even inches ahead of the 3070 by 4%. A great start for the 6700 XT. But Odyssey is the older game in the series, and uh, Valhalla is the latest release, which is based on DX12 instead, and perhaps it should be more scalable, therefore. Curiously, though, I found that the 6800 only 14% faster than the 6700 XT, so there are still some scalability issues there. 6700 XT still enjoys a small lead over the 3070 in the region of around 4% again, and so as you might expect, it's a good chunk faster than 3060 Ti where I found that the Radeon card has a 12 percentage point lead. So interesting to see that despite being a new game on a new rendering API, Valhalla seems to offer performance differentials in line with its predecessor, AC Odyssey. Now, we're going to have more on Valhalla later, as this isn't quite everything I've got to say about it. Death Stranding, though, indicates how challenging the whole price versus performance situation is. On the face of it, another decent AMD win here. There's a 10% performance increase moving from 3060 Ti to 6700 XT. 
while we're essentially on level pegging when comparing the new AMD card with the 3070. Well, a percentage point or two more for Nvidia across the run of the bench, but you won't be able to tell in actual gaming. Now that all changes when we factor in DLSS quality mode on the RTX side. Suddenly, the $400 3060Ti is beating the $580 RX 6800. 3060Ti is 21% faster than the 6700 XT, while the 3070 is basically 30 points ahead. Aside from minor ghosting issues on the BT's, overall image quality via DLSS is also improved over native rendering. So it's a tough one. Months on from its announcement, we're still none the wiser about AMD's open alternative to Nvidia's AI upscaling. A look at the brilliant Metro Exodus next. Performance on AMD hardware is variable, but overall across the length of the sequence, the 6700 XT delivers the same average result as the 3060 Ti, while the 3070 is 13 points ahead. 6800 on the whole is actually 20 points to the better. Curious stuff. Dirt Rally 2.0 next, a stupendously long benchmark set across an entire stage of the game. So I guess you could call it comprehensive. And it's also interesting in that the Ego engine is one of the few still to actively support MSAA, multi-sample anti-aliasing. And in this benchmark, we have that working in combination with TAA. So again, in the moment results shift, but across the entirety of the stage, 6700 XT is effectively on par with 3060 Ti, a much cheaper card. 3070 is on another level here with a 36% lead. Very much an outlier though. Even the base 6800 has a 30% lead, which is very much against the overall run of results we'll see. Overall, it does emphasize that the notion of boiling down a GPU as being X percent faster or slower than another doesn't quite work as a concept anymore. Everything is a lot more granular on a game to game basis. So there's been a select group of games in our benchmark suite that are more modern and forward looking in their rendering and seem to be a better fit for the latest and greatest GPUs. We've referred to them in the past as the super performers and they certainly throw up some intriguing results whenever we look at them. Doom Eternal first based on id Tech 7, an engine that works on current gen consoles and even Nintendo Switch but is fundamentally designed for the hardware of tomorrow which is effectively the hardware of today now. Here, 6700 XT initially seems to perform much as you would expect, but we are throwing a curveball a bit later on. Now, the bar chart suggests that this slots into place directly between 3060 Ti and 3070. RX 6800 is about 20% faster, so fairly closely in line with the difference in notional MSRPs. Still factor in the extra RAM the 6700 XT has, and it's a nice counterpoint to the Nvidia competition. But more than that, this is the one bench where the extra RAM does make a difference. At the end of the test sequence, when we move into the more open world, RAM consumption goes sky high and Radeon retains performance where GeForce, which is limited to eight gigabytes, does not. Now, to be fair, Ultra Nightmare textures are textbook excess, but this is the one test we have where the extra memory is clearly making a difference. I mean, look at the differentials there. Borderlands 3, the game that has kind of come to define the next-gen GPU battle for some reason. Well, that's next and it does not disappoint. It's a title that is a massive performer for the 6700 XT to the point where the 3060 Ti is left well behind. It's actually inching ahead of RTX 3070. Yes, Borderlands 3 is a UE4 title. Yes, DLSS is now a standard component of UE4, but thus far there is no DLSS support. It's a straight head-to-head -head comparison and 6700 XT performs very, very well here, no doubt about it. RX 6800, an extra 20 compute units running at a lower clock, but you are getting an extra 20% of performance. So it seems that the high clocks of the 6700 XT allow this card to punch above its weight. It's a bit of a star performer for the RX 6700 XT then, but that's not the end of the Borderlands story. More on that in a bit. Shadow of the Tomb Raider, not quite so dramatic after all of that. The RX 6700 XT returns to trading blows with 3060 Ti across the entirety of the three sequences in the bench, while RTX 3070 pushes ahead. Our numbers 
give the RX 6800 a 23% lead at the target 1440p. So again, fairly closely in line with the difference in notional asking prices. Fascinating to see the spread here overall though. Different games, yes, they favor different architectures. So yeah, expect to see quite a spread in reviews depending on what titles are tested. I've already talked about Remedies Control here, even without DLSS active, 3060 Ti is 7% faster and the 6700 XT is pretty much on par with RTX 2080. That was the closest parallel I could find. A quick look at raid facing performance next. I think it's early days for RT on AMD. Games simply aren't optimized to the specific strengths of the Radeon implementation. And I'm definitely going to be interested to see the enhanced version of Metro Exodus due soon, where I'd assume that its 60 FPS target on PlayStation 5 and Series X would bring about better AMD performance in the PC desktop space. Regardless, in the here and now, it's not particularly great. RX 6700 XT is consistently slower than 3060 Ti, and while differentials shift according to content, by our reckoning, the overall result puts the 6700 XT just ahead of RTX 2070 and therefore RTX 3060. 3060 Ti about 30% faster overall. Battlefield 5 also isn't that great. Again, the Nvidia competitors are way ahead and in common with all the RDNA 2 cards tested so far. This game, in this sequence at any rate, well, there's poor frame time consistency on the AMD side and that depresses results to the point where RTX 2070 and even the 3060 are inching ahead of the AMD offering here. Again, it's another game literally built with a competing architecture in mind, but that's the lie of the land right now and I would expect things to change. Remedies control? Problematic. Rasterization performance isn't great for AMD in this title, while the added burden of ray tracing keeps Team Red out of the game. And again, you'd likely be running DLSS on an Nvidia card, extending the green team's lead still further. Even without DLSS, RTX 2070 is actually faster here, while even the 3060 can outscore the 6700 XT by around 14%, and that's not good. We're gonna need more from AMD here and more from developers. Moving on to an area where AMD has rightfully received kudos for taking point, resizable bar or smart access memory as AMD calls it. It continues to impress, essentially allowing CPU to address GPU memory more efficiently with performance increases for free, basically as a result, if your system is compatible, of course. So in previous videos, we've noted games that see a small difference, titles that do really well, and other offerings where there's presumably no driver support, therefore no change at all. However, for this review, we really wanted to see what the tech was capable of. So we picked a few titles that AMD itself specifically points out as delivering big performance boosts. Okay, so remember when I said we'd return to Borderlands 3 and indeed AC Valhalla? Well, let's do just that. And this is what I like to see in a performance graph parallel lines with a decent amount of space between them. AMD's reviewer's guide talks about Ryzen 5000 and Ryzen 3000 CPU support, but my ASUS Maximus 12 Extreme motherboard opens up smart access memory to Intel chips too. So my Core i9-10900K is invited to the party. Borderlands 3, a 12.6% performance boost at 1080p, dropping to 8.4% at 1440p but even at 4K, I noted a 4.3% performance increase. So good stuff then, right? Assassin's Creed Valhalla, again, 12.4% of extra throughput at 1080p, dropping to 8.6% at 1440p. It's not plotted on the graph, but you're still looking at a 3% boost at 2160p. Though I really wouldn't recommend this card for high-end 4K gaming, neither would I recommend it for 1080p, to be honest, it's just too fast even for the fastest CPUs. I didn't bother to plot the 1080p results for Battlefield 5 here because it's a CPU limited disaster in this environment, whether you have SAM enabled or not. But a 7% gain at 1440p and a 5% boost at 4K is not to be sniffed at. So now it's time for the wrap up and in a sense, not much has changed from the outlook as Big Navi presented it. AMD has proven that its new architecture is the match for NVIDIA in many titles. It's actually faster in some, but off the pace in others. 
Ray tracing performance isn't quite where it should be, but neither is it actually bad as such. It's just that without an equivalent DLSS as an accelerant to performance, it's more of a tough sell. What I am liking though is pushing memory allocation higher because in the fullness of time it may well prove very useful and it certainly had an impact on the competitive landscape. I can't help but think that RTX 3060 wouldn't have shipped with 12 gigs if the 6700 family cards didn't up the ante in this area. I'm also liking resizable bar. Yes, titles that actually support it seem to be thin on the ground, the performance uplifts may be variable. But hey, it's new and potentially very impactful. And while Nvidia has its own implementation in the offing, it's AMD that has taken point here. There are enough plus and minus points to the RX 6700 XT uh, that it's not a slam dunk. There's no killer blow against the Nvidia Ampere cards. And I think with the MSRPs that AMD has set, there's certainly not the same level of disruption that Ryzen delivered. So with that in mind, I'll be curious to see how the inevitable non-XT 6700 plays out. It's been leaked enough to confirm it's a real thing and it's mooted 36 compute unit setup quite close to the PlayStation 5 configuration, which will be interesting to check out. But that's all from me for now. Please like, subscribe and share if you enjoyed the work and ring the bell for instant notifications when we drop new content. Oh, and be sure to check out our Patreon. The Digital Foundry Supporter Program opens the door to a new community on our Discord server. And of course, you'll get pristine quality video downloads of everything we do. But that's all from me for now. Thanks for making it all the way to the end of this one, if indeed you did. And just generally, thanks for watching and supporting Digital Foundry.